A True Story, Repeated Word for Word as I Heard It, by Mark Twain. It was summertime and twilight. We were sitting on the porch of the farmhouse on the summit of the hill, and Aunt Rachel was sitting respectfully below our level on the steps, for she was our servant and colored. She was a mighty frame and stature. She was 60 years old, but her eye was undimmed and her strength unabated. She was a cheerful, hearty soul, and it was no more trouble for her to laugh than it is for a bird to sing. She was under fire now, as usual, when the day was done. That is to say, she was being chaffed without mercy and was enjoying it. She would let off peal after peal of laughter and then sit with her face in her hands and shake with throes of enjoyment, which she could no longer get breath enough to express. At such a moment as this, a thought occurred to me, and I said, Aunt Rachel... How is it that you've lived 60 years and never had any trouble? She stopped quaking. She paused, and there was a moment of silence. She turned her face over her shoulder toward me and said, without even a smile in her voice, Mr. C., is you an honest? It surprised me a good deal, and it sobered my manner and my speech, too, I said. Why, I thought, that is, I meant, why, you can't have had any trouble, I've never heard you sigh and never seen your eye when there wasn't a laugh in it. She faced fairly around now and was full of earnestness. Has I had any trouble, Mr. C? I was going to tell you then. I leave it to you. I was born down amongst the slaves. I knows all about slavery because I've been one of them my own self. Well, sir, my old man, that's my husband, he was loving and kind to me, just as kind as you is to your own wife. And we had children, seven children, and we loved them children just the same as you loves your children. They was black, but the Lord can't make no children so black but what their mother loves them and wouldn't give them up. No, not for anything that's in this whole world. Well, sir, I was raised in old folk, Jenny, but my mother, she was raised in Maryland. And my soul, she was terrible when she'd get started. My land, but she'd make the fur fly. When she'd get into them tantrums, she always had one word that she said. She'd straighten herself up and put her fists in her hips and say, I want you to understand that I won't born in the mash to be fooled by trash. As one of the old blue hen's chickens I is. Because, you see, that's what folks that's born in Maryland calls themselves, and they's proud of it. Well, that was her word. I don't ever forget it, because she said it so much. And because she said it one day when my little Henry tore his wrist awful and most busted his head right up at the top of his forehead, and the niggas didn't fly around fast enough to tend to him. And when they talked back at her, she up and she says, Look a here, as she says, I want you niggas to understand that I want bone in the mash to be fooled by trash. As one of the old blue hens chickens I is. And then she clear that kitchen and bandage up the child herself. So I says that word too when I was riled. Well, by and by, my old mistress say she's broke and she got to sell all the niggas on the place. And when I hear that, they gwine to sell us all off at action in Richmond. Oh, the good gracious. He's broke. And she got to sell all the niggas on the place. And when I hear that, they gwine to sell us all off at action in Richmond. Oh, the good gracious. I know what that means. Aunt Rachel had gradually risen while she warmed to her subject, and now she towered above us, black against the stars. They put chains on us and put us on a stand as high as this poach, 20 foot high. And all the people stood around, crowds and crowds, and they'd come up there and look at us all around and squeeze our arm and make us get up and walk and then say, this one don't mount to much. And they sold my old man and took him away. And they began to sell my children and take them away. And I began to cry and the man say, shut up your damn blubbering and hit me on the mouth with his hand. And when the last one was gone but my little Henry, I grab him close up to my breast, so, and I rise up and says, you shan't take him away. I says, I'll kill the man that touches him. I says, but my little Henry whisper and say, 
I grind to run away, and then I work and buy your freedom. Oh, bless the child. He always so good. But they got him. They got him. The men did. But I took and tear the clothes most off of them and beat them over the head with my chain. And they give it to me, too. But I didn't mind that. Well, that was my old man gone and all my children, all my seven children. And six of them I hain't set eyes on again to this day. And that's 22 years ago, last Easter. The man that brought me belonged in Newburn, and he took me there. Well, by and by, the years roll on, and the war come. My master, he was a Confederate colonel, and I was his family's cook. So when the unions took that town, they all run away and left me all by myself with the other niggas in that monstrous big house. So the big union officers move in there, and they ask what I cook for them. Lord bless you, says I. That's what I asked for. They weren't no small fry officers, mind you. They was the biggest they is. And the way they made them soldiers mosey round. The general, he told me to boss that kitchen. And he say, if anybody come meddling with you, you just make them walk chalk. Don't you be afeard, he say. Use among friends now. Well, I thinks to myself, if my little Henry ever got a chance to run away, he'd make to the north, of course. So one day I comes in there where the big officers was in the parlor, and I drops a kerchief so, and I up and told them about my Henry. They are listening to my troubles just the same as if I was white folks. And I says, what I come for is because if he got away and got up north where you Jimin comes from, you might have seen him maybe and could tell me so as I could find him again. He was very little, and he had a scar on his left wrist and at the top of his forehead. Then they mournful, and the general say, How long since you lost him? And I say, Thirteen year. Then the general say, He wouldn't be little no more. Now he's a man. I never thought of that before. He was only that little fella to me yet. I never thought about him growing up and being big, but I see it then. None of the gentlemen had run across him, so they couldn't do nothing for me. But all that time, though I didn't know it, my Henry was run off to the north years and years, as, and he was a barber, too, and worked for himself. And by and by, when the wall came, he ups and he says, I's done barbering, he says. I's gwine to find my old mammy. Listen, she's dead. So he sold out and went to where they was recruiting and hired himself out to do colonel for his servant. And then he went through the battles everywhere, hunting his old mammy. Yes, indeedy. He'd hired to fuss one officer and then another till he'd ransacked the whole South. But you see, I didn't know nothing about this. How was I going to know it? Well, one night, we had a big soldier ball. The soldiers there at Newburn was always having balls and carrying on. They had them in my kitchen heaps of times because it was so big. Mind you, I was down on such doings because my place was with the officers, and it rasped me to have them common soldiers cavorting round my kitchen like that. But I always stood round and kept things straight, I did. And sometimes they'd get my dander up. And then I'd make them clear that kitchen, mind I tell you. Well, one night, it was a Friday night, there comes a whole platoon from a nigger regiment that was on guard at the house. The house was headquarters, you know. And then I was just a bowling. Mad. Mad? I was just a booming. I swelled around and swelled around. I just was a itching for them to do something to start me. And they was a waltzing and a dancing. My, but they was having a time. And I just a swelling and a swelling up. Pretty soon, long comes such a spryce young nigger a sailing down the room with a yellow wrench round the waist. And round and round and round they went, enough to make a body drunk to look at them. And when they got abreast of me, they went to kind of balancing around, fussed on one leg and then on the other and smiling at my big red turban and making fun. And I ups and says, get along with you, rubbage. The young man's face kind of changed all of a sudden for about a second. 
But then he went to smiling again, same as he was before. Well, about this time, in comes some niggas that played music and belonged to the band. And they never could get along without putting on airs. And the very first air they put on that night, I lit into them. They laughed, and that made me wuss. The rest of the niggas got to laughing. And then my soul alive, but I was hot. My eye was just a-blazing. I just straightened myself up so, just as I is now, plumb to the ceiling most. And I digs my fist into my hips and I says, look a here, I says. I want you niggas to understand that I want bone in the mash to be fooled by trash. As one of the old blue hens chickens, I is. And then I see that young man stand up staring and stiff, looking kind of up at the ceiling like he forgot something and couldn't remember it no more. Well, I just marching on them niggas, so looking like a gentle. And they just cave away before me and out at the door. And as this young man was a going out, I hear him say to another nigga, Jim, he says, you go long and tell the captain I be on hand about 8 o'clock in the morning. There's something on my mind, he says. I don't sleep no more this night. You go long, he says, and leave me by my own self. This was about one o'clock in the morning. Well, about seven, I was up and on hand, getting the officer's breakfast. I was a stooping down by the stove, just so, same as if your foot was the stove. And I'd opened the stove do with my right hand, so pushing it back, just as I pushes your foot. And I just got the pan of hot biscuits in my hand and was about to raise up when I see a black face come round under mine. And the eyes are looking up into mine, just as eyes are looking up close to under your face now. And I just stopped right there and never budged. I just gazed and gazed so. And the pan began to tremble. And all of a sudden, I knowed the pan dropped on the floor. And I grabbed his left hand and shoved back his sleeve just so as I was doing to you. And then I goes for his forehead and pushed the hair back so. And boy, I says, if you ain't my Henry, what is you doing with this welt on your wrist and that scar on your forehead? The Lord God of heaven be praised. I got my own again. Oh, no, Mr. C. I ain't had no trouble and no joy. <laughs>